five years while they were in office. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much what's <laughs> happened to me over the last five years. Oh, man. <laughs> it's been brutal. But anyway, hey, thanks. It's always good to visit with you, Dave. Hey, thanks for being on here. Uh, you know, I just wanted to start off with the economy. And we have Charles Nenner out there, Harry Cliff High, Jim Rogers. They're all saying that something bad is going to happen the latter part of this year. And when you look at the economy and you look around and you see what's happening, what's your take on what's going on right now? Well, it, I would always caution against this something bad's going to happen later on this year. You know, the old the old adage was back when I began as a stockbroker back in the early 90s was you never wanted to give date and price in the same sentence. You know, to say that Walmart's going to 40 sounds pretty good. But when you say Walmart's going to 40 by Christmas is a whole other story. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, if, if what, if the world doesn't end or then bad things that happen by the end of this year, you know, I'm sure Harry and, and, uh, the, all the rest will come back with another forecast for 2018. But, uh, uh, I am wary though of what I continually call the generally accepted narrative. And we're getting a dose of it again, uh, here this morning with, uh, Mother Felon in front of the Senate Banking Committee with her Humphrey Hawkins testimony. There's this narrative that's been promoted heavily ever since the election of Trump that this 2017 was an easily predictable year. This is, you know, no problem at all. The dollar's going to get stronger and interest rates are going to go up and the bond bubble is going to burst and the stock market's going to go higher as if it was all just a fade of completely. And I, maybe it will be. I mean, there are a lot of smart people that think that. I tend to be a little more contrarian in nature and think that when everyone is on the same side of the trade, usually it doesn't go that direction. So far in 2017, it's played out that way, though. Uh, now the dollar and the dollar yen are bouncing back up a little bit. But, you know, the dollar at one point uh, was down almost 4% year to date before this little bounce began. Uh, about a week or so ago. So we'll see. We'll see if it's as simple as everybody uh, leads you to believe. You know, all these rate hikes are getting priced in. We've been promised rate hikes since, what, 2009? Yeah. And so far we've gotten one each over the last two years. Uh, you know, I'm going to have to see it to believe it. Um, I, again, I just, I just don't know if 2017 will play out in the manner that you know, everybody seems to expect it will. Now, Trump, as he came into office, actually, when he was campaigning, he was talking about, get, you know, bringing back jobs, manufacturing other jobs, keeping uh, jobs from going overseas. And he talked to Carrier, Ford, GM, and a lot of these companies, they're, they're still taking the jobs and moving them to Mexico. They haven't really changed anything. Now, as Trump is continually out there saying this, do you think with the current economy, do you think he can actually bring the jobs back to the U.S.? Will that even make a difference? Well, that's what you wonder about. You know, frankly, I have, uh, this may sound like really way out there, whacked out, but I've always thought in a sense some of the job exporting was actually related in a way to the petrodollar scheme. You know how um, the, the, the Kissinger came up with that back in the early 70s. You know, if we were always price energy in dollars, there'll always be demand for dollars, and those dollars that we print here will get incubated and recycled and all that kind of stuff. And I think the tax structure of the U.S. was also set up in a similar manner, so that if we continue to offload manufacturing and, and get goods to be manufactured in other you know parts around the world and other places around the world where they can be manufactured uh, less expensively and then shipped here, that that is also um, a way to kind of incubate dollars, ship dollars overseas when we buy these other countries' goods, uh, and again get them all incubated. I, I you know, look, I'm I'm no tenured economist, so I haven't written papers on this kind of thing, but that's just always been my idea. And so I wonder if um, one, if he'd be successful in remaking the U.S. economy, and can any president actually do that? And if it isn't too far gone, and if that system isn't already so entrenched that there's not much he can do. Uh, lowering the corporate taxes and trying to, I guess as they call it, repatriate these funds that are held overseas by these U.S. corporations and have those dollars come back so that the government can tax them. Um, I wonder about that from an, almost from an inflationary standpoint. Uh, I don't know if it'd be significant enough that it would yeah, cause much inflation. But a lot of these things that he's talking about are, uh, it's really difficult to predict how it might all play out should it come to pass. 
then it, which I guess kind of gets back to what we talked about in the first question, you know, is, is it really that predictable and straightforward as to, as to how a Trump administration is going to play out? If we listen to what Mario Draghi, Christine Lagarde, and Fitch just currently, they said, oh, yeah, you know, Trump's economic policies, what they're forecasting is that the economy might, you know, suffer under this. And if the economy, not just here in the United States, but globally, start to deteriorate, uh, it's because of Trump's policies. And Mario Draghi said this, Christine Lagarde said this, Fitch said this. And to me, it sounds like they're kind of setting him up to take the fall for the economy deteriorating as we move forward. Yeah, you know, and and on a, on that kind of similar note, Dave, you know, he's got Trump has as his chief trade advisor, I think is the guy's title, a gentleman by the name of Peter Navarro. Mm-hmm. And this guy set his sights on a, in a couple of places already. You know, that Trump has talked about Mexico and a border tax and tariffs and things like that and and then Navarro himself was out talking about the ECB and the euro and and how the euro uh, is undervalued versus a dollar. And that kind of rocked the currency markets one day a couple of weeks ago. Well, this cat Navarro, uh, besides being a I guess he's a Harvard economist, he's an author. And two of his, I guess, more popular books, uh, one is called uh, The China Wars. And then the second one is called Death by China. And it's like, well, okay, uh, how long before this guy turns his sights on China? And, you know, the, one of the, if you want to call him the biggest currency manipulator, I don't, I would say the Japanese are probably the biggest currency manipulators, but with their, the way that PBOC pegs the yuan to the dollar, um, I think it's probably just a matter of time before that gets shoved to the forefront and Trump's trade policies vis-a-vis China and the tariffs and things like that that he discussed during the campaign. You just don't know how some of this stuff is going to play out, how it's going to be received, not only in the markets, but interpreted by the computers that run all the markets. Um, I, I, it would just have to wait and see. And I'll give you one more thing too, Dave. You know, that there was one thing that really moved everything one day last week was when Trump mentioned something about you know, his huge tax cuts that were coming and they were going to be spectacular and we'd have something in two or three weeks. And that sent the dollar, you know, screaming higher and that kind of thing. And um, that's like as if he's just going to wave a magic wand in two or three weeks and these things are going to happen and the effects on the economy are going to be instantaneous. You know, he might have a plan. He might have a couple of ideas he puts forth, but that stuff's got to go through Congress. And then it all has to then eventually take effect. And it, most of it wouldn't take effect immediately if it even did get passed. I mean, we talk in late this year, next year. And then by the time any of that trickled down to the actual economy, it's another couple of quarters. But yet these markets these days, again, as they're all run by computers and all these computers scan the headlines, I, I guess I'll just draw back again to where we began. You know, I, I think we have to be kind of cautious with all of this stuff because we just don't know, one, what Trump will suggest how and then how that will uh, affect all the different global markets. No, that's true. I I wanted to move on to gold right now. And last time you're on, we talked about Germany repatriating their gold. Uh, They wanted 300 tons. And it looks like that has been completed. It looks like they got all their gold back. But I don't know if you saw this, but something was very interesting about the gold bars they received. They had different labels on the bars than what they had before. And that is kind of strange. Does that tell you something? Does that mean that maybe the Fed really didn't have the gold? Right. What does that say to you? Well, that was kind of the thought at the time. Um, yeah, it, that's always been part of it. And then, if I recall right, the, in the first six or seven metric tons that they that they pulled out in 2013, they they immediately had them recast. And that how that initially worked. I mean, they shipped them some to some refinery in Germany or Switzerland and had them recast and all that. And people thought, you know, was the U.S. just kind of fending off some of their old coin melt bars from the 1930s, you know, that were 90 percent purity? Uh, it, it, there were I just have always been all these questions surrounding that German repatriation schedule. And, you know, as you talk about um, Europe and Germany, I that's certainly an interesting item. I But, you know. As we look forward into this year, I think perhaps even more compelling will be the demand for physical from just 
everyday Europeans. Because one of the things that hasn't changed is obviously Brexit is moving forward now. We're going to have a vote. Well, we had the vote of the House of Commons was last week. And now the House of Lords will be back. I think it's a week from Friday. And they'll begin whatever they do to eventually give Prime Minister May the approval to go ahead with Article 50 and Brexit. And then we've got now we've got everything that's going on in Greece rearing its ugly head again. We've got the continuing problems in Italy. And we got Marine Le Pen kind of riding, a, riding the same wave that Trump rode. There, is, there are real threats to the European Union and this single European currency. And so if you're a, a regular European, you know, wherever you live, Luxembourg or Belgium or whatever, and you're faced with a kind of a double whammy of negative or zero interest rates on your savings in euros, but then a devaluing euro because, I mean, it may be going the way of the dodo bird. You look at that and you think, well, I've got to have an alternative for how I'm going to hold my savings. And I think that could be a real significant grassroot demand for physical gold uh, in the in the months ahead. And that's that's another story for 2017 that people need to really keep an eye on. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the Brexit and the EU and a lot of the other countries. Most likely they'll have some type of referendum saying we don't want to be part of the EU. We see it's heading that toward, toward that direction. And Germany, like we just mentioned, was asking for all their gold back. Why do you think they um, in, um, accelerated the process of getting the gold back to their country? D do they know something? Yeah, that makes you wonder, doesn't it? Because, again, now it, it's, we're speculating here, and there could be any one of a number of reasons. But that's certainly... Uh, in the ballpark of rationale, isn't it? That they would think, yeah, yeah they were going to play ball and, and, you know, and wait their seven years to get their 300 tons. And then they could see these dominoes falling into each other. And they said, wait a second, hold on just a minute. Uh, you better give us that gold now because there's all this uh, turbulence on the horizon. Yeah. I mean, no doubt about it. I mean, we talk about Grexit and Brexit and Frexit for France and Italy for Italy. Um, there are a lot of, I mean, really, if you just take yourself back three or four years, just the structural problems, you know, of the, the Northern Euro area, basically paying for and covering the debts of the Southern Euro area, you know, we had all these talks about whether the Euro would split apart just based on those structural problems. And now you got people, countries just wanting to leave the Euro. Um, yeah, I mean, that that could be, at least I'm holding out hope that it will be, one of the key drivers of physical gold demand that finally, finally breaks apart this. It's really a scheme, a, a paper derivative pricing scheme that has held for the metals since, you know, the mid-70s. Um, it's what we're all waiting for. And something like that, it could be finally enough significant demand of people wanting it in their own hands, not wanting to play in the unallocated system, not wanting just shares of some ETF, not wanting a pooled account at UBS, but actually wanting the real thing in their own safe because it's such a time of monetary change. Um, that could be enough to, to really uh, upset the apple cart that the bullion banks have been pushing along now for <laughs> 40 some odd years. You, know, you you mentioned uh, gold and the, the precious metals market, and we saw the manipulation with like Deutsche Bank and other banks, and they paid fines and things like that. But nothing really happened. It looks like the manipulation is continuing. Like nothing's really changed. Uh, you know, gold moves up and down just a little bit, and every time it starts to move up, all of a sudden it's pushed right back down into this area. It really hasn't gone anywhere for a very long time. And yeah. oh, I'm sorry, Dave. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. So please. No, I was just gonna. One thing I was gonna say was Cliff High was saying when I was uh, having an interview with him that silver is going to be a very close relationship to gold later on and it's going to be you know worth almost as much as gold that you know it would be interesting to see if it if it gets to that point uh you know when i look at the the silver market and uh if you could see me right now i'm, I'm making like the little quotation marks with my fingers like people do <laughs> when i say the word market it, it's a, a great example of uneconomic pricing because i mean heck at 18 dollars an ounce silver is basically the same price that it was in the late 70s I mean, 40 years ago 
I, everybody says, well, you know, uh, silver is a great uh, hedge against inflation and all this kind of, it's a commodity and then commodities go up as inflation all there. Really? 40 years. How about that? Yeah. Uh huh. What else has not gone up for 40 years? Silver uh, is about it. And why is that? It is because the market that is used to price, come up with a price for silver has nothing to do with the actual exchange of physical silver. The price is instead set on these electronic derivative exchanges. And then people accept that price that's discovered for these derivatives is the price for the spot physical. It doesn't make any sense. It Again, in, in these derivatives markets, like right now, the, the, the COMEX in New York has an, a total open interest of silver contracts of 195,000 contracts. Each contract represents 5,000 ounces. So we're talking 975 million virtual digital ounces of silver that are available on the COMEX. There's no, there's not 975 million ounces of silver on the COMEX. I mean, and the, the silver that's there, half of it's controlled by JP Morgan, but that's a whole other story. What, what, what is there is 975 million virtual ounces. Heck, Dave, the world only produces as annual supply about 880 million ounces. So how is it that the exchange where price is discovered could have 110% of global supply in open interest? And at the end of the day, it's this unlimited creation, this infinite creation of these derivative contracts that has led to a distortion in what should be a, an economically viable price for silver. The, the two symbols of, of that distortion are the ongoing supply deficit. You get those numbers now. I mean, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, Steve St. Angelo would tell you we've been in a silver supply deficit now for the last 15 years. Even more, I guess we'll call it conservative outlets like Thomson Reuters or GFMS would say at least the last five years we've been in a supply deficit for silver. And on another level, it's that pricing structure that explains a gold-silver ratio of 70 to 1 or whatever the hell it is at this point. I mean, for time immemorial, it's been, what, 12 to 1, 16 to 1? And now suddenly it's 70 to 1? Well, why is it 70 to 1? Because, again, the price that you're using in that ratio is not determined by the physical exchange of silver. Oh, sure, there's silver exchange at that price, but the price that's used is determined by the supply and demand of the derivative. I mean, it's it's just, it's a convoluted uh, scheme that is rife with corruption, as you mentioned, uh, with insider trading and manipulation and fraud. And unfortunately, it's the system we have until it finally breaks. Now, what you mentioned, though, is the right thing to do is the right thing to do is to understand that this price is inaccurate, uneconomic, whatever you want to call it, and then use that to your advantage and then just wait until the system finally collapses under the weight of the, I guess, the <laughs> deceit and the fraud. No, that's true. And and, and I mean, right now, uh, it's so cheap that you should be hoarding it. You should bought, be buying as much as you possibly can because, you know, eventually it, the system will break. I mean, we I mean, if you just look around and you can see all the economic data, I'm not talking about the stock market. I'm talking about the real economic data with retail contracting, GDP manipulated, unemployment manipulated. I mean, every, really, we're living in an economic illusion right now. Mm hmm. And the truth is actually going to crush away the illusion and things are going to change dramatically. When is that going to happen? Don't exactly know. But it seems like as we move, you know, month to month to month, it seems like, you know, you can tell that things aren't going as planned because, you know, they blame, you know, retail on the weather, but retail continually contracts. GDP not never got over 3%. I think it was what, on average like 1.8% throughout the whole year. And that's the manipulated number. Yeah. And unemployment, I mean, that th there's companies still laying off. I mean, I just saw Credit Suisse going to be laying off another 6,500 people today. Right. And, and uh, Dave, I'll give you a number that can't be fudged, or I guess is maybe more difficult to fudge because it's not just statistical guesswork. Uh, late, I guess it was Friday, Treasury budget came out and they noted the, the tax receipts for December. Yep. Um, I think it was to say it was either December, January, I believe it was December. And 
Uh, you know, there was headlines. I saw some stories actually even Monday that said, oh, U.S. tax receipts hit a record and all this kind of stuff. But what the way you have to look at it, though, is year over year. And year over year, tax receipts have fallen. And that right there is, I mean, tax rates haven't changed. And so if you want a real measure of economic activity and employment and all that kind of stuff, federal, U.S. federal government tax receipts is a great way to look at it. Zero Hedge noted this on Friday. They put up a chart showing that over the last five occasions when tax receipts year over year have moved into negative, it has always been a precursor of recession. So, you you know, these the BLS and the uh, all the other government agencies can sit there and crank out their statistical guesswork of how many jobs were added, you know, and all that kind of jazz. And and uh, Mother Yellen can talk all about, you know, the robust economy at full employment when we have 95 million people not in the labor force and all that kind of stuff. But when, when it gets down to brass tacks and you actually see hard data that really can't be fudged, those tax receipts, you realize, oh, well, maybe the U.S. economy isn't really humming along as much as they would lead you to believe that's absolutely true i just wanted to get quickly for the last part here i want to talk about geopolitical things happening around the world i mean right now we see trump is telling you know china you know be careful we're gonna you know sail our ships in the south china sea we see iran things are heating up there ukraine we see war is heating up there kim Jong un's brother uh kim jong nam he was a he was assassinated, murdered, something, he died, he was 45, and someone saying that there were two women, they stuck him with this needle or something, and then they, they left the area. So to me, it seems like there are other powers, forces at work here, trying to push us maybe into a war. Do you, do you see any of that? Yeah, I, I we follow that really closely at TF Metals Report, and I, and I saw that the thing on Kim Jong-un's brother, I think, I mean, I hate to make light of the guy because he's dead, but uh, he got a pretty good deal. He had to figure his time was, you know, numbered. Uh, any sunrise he saw, he had to figure, oh, I didn't expect to wake up today because eventually he had to figure his brother was going to come get him to get stuck with poison and just drop dead is a much better fate than Uncle General June, who I think they strapped to a slab of concrete and mortared. Right. Remember that? Yep. <laughs> so this guy, is, at least he was nice enough to his brother to just hit him with some poison. Anyway, uh, yeah, I don't know how. Uh, how that's going to play out, you know, they're shooting off missiles and the Iranians are doing their thing. I, I still, my most grave concern, and we've chronicled it at TF Metals Report now for three years, is the situation in Ukraine and uh, the the war party, as we call it, of the West that is doing everything they can to, uh, it seems, to provoke some type of conflict with Russia. And now, you know, three years on, War seems to be heating up again in the southeast of Ukraine, uh, where the, the, the Kiev government, with help from NATO and U.S. advisors, is uh, up against you know, these kind of, they call them separatists, but, you know, I mean, they're just regional southeast Ukrainians that don't want any part of the Kiev government. And now we've got, you know, both sides of loggerheads down there. I think that's a very dangerous situation. In the time since that was originally kind of beginning to draw headlines three years ago. Now NATO in the U.S. have positioned troops into the Baltics, into Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania, which so basically directly on Russia's western border. That is the first time since June of 1941 that hostile, potentially hostile troops have been directly upon Russia's western border border. That's why they had the Iron Curtain, right? They they pushed their borders out to Poland and East Germany and all the rest to keep troops off their border. Why, you know, if, if you're a Russian uh, that with any knowledge of history, at the last time there were foreign hostile troops right on your border 75 years ago, that didn't turn out so well. That led to 26.3 million dead Russians. And so you kind of remember that stuff. And believe me, the Russians remember that stuff. And so us putting troops there, you know, because we're going to stop that rascally Putin, that just isn't, that's looked at in a totally different light than what the American media portrays it as uh, here. And so I think that's a, again, we'll just put that in the wild card category. 
for 2017. Uh, and if anything it, we, it, that we need to be you know, hopeful and, and pray about is that that doesn't flare up into uh, what could conceivably be the, the, the worst conflict, worst global scare since the Cuban Missile Crisis. This notion that that uh, 2017, you know, it's going to be great, man. The stock market's going to 25,000 and the dollar's going to king dollar. And the inter- I mean, as if, again, it's all just a fait accompli. And I would just suggest that maybe um, things are a little more complicated than that and that people need to be uh, a little more contrarian to the generally accepted narrative of, of what lies ahead. Craig, I really appreciate you coming on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? Uh, TFMetalsReport.com. We all recognize that this debt-based financial system is, is it's a mathematical certainty that eventually it's going to run out of run out of gas, and we're all kind of preparing for that end. And so I encourage everybody to check it out again at TFMetalsReport.com. Craig, once again, thank you very much for being on the Spotlight. Dave, my pleasure. It's always fun five years while they were in office Mm -hmm. that's pretty much what's (laughs) happened to me over the last five years oh man (laughs) it's been brutal but anyway hey thanks it's always good to visit with you Dave. hey thanks for being on here Uh, you know i just wanted to start off with the economy and we have charles nenner out there harry den cliff high jim rogers they're all saying that something bad is going to happen the latter part of this year and when you look at the economy and you look around and you see what's happening What's your take on what's going on right now? Well, I would always caution against this something bad's going to happen later on this year. You know, the old the old adage was back when I began as a stockbroker back in the early 90s was you never wanted to give date and price in the same sentence. You know, to say that Walmart's going to 40 sounds pretty good. But when you say Walmart's going to 40 by Christmas is a whole other story. <laughs> and so... Uh, you know, if, if what, if the world doesn't end or then bad things that happen by the end of this year, you know, I'm sure Harry and, and, uh, the, all the rest will come back with another forecast for 2018. But, uh, uh, I am wary though of what I continually call the generally accepted narrative. And we're getting a dose of it again, uh, here this morning with, uh, mother felon in front of the Senate banking committee with her Humphrey Hawkins testimony. There's this narrative that's been promoted heavily ever since the election of Trump that this 2017 was an easily predictable year. It's is you know, no problem at all. The dollar's going to get stronger and interest rates are going to go up and the bond bubble is going to burst and the stock market's going to go higher as if it was all just a fait accompli. And I, maybe it will be. I mean, there are a lot of smart people that think that. I tend to be a little more contrarian in nature and think that when everyone is on the same side of the trade, usually it doesn't go that direction. So far in 2017, it's played out that way, though. Uh, now the dollar and the dollar yen are bouncing back up a little bit. But, you know, the dollar at one point uh, was down almost 4% year to date before this little bounce on this kind of thing. But that's just always been my idea. And so I wonder if um, one, if he'd be successful in remaking the U.S. economy, and can any president actually do that? And if it isn't too far gone, and if that system isn't already so entrenched that there's not much he can do, uh, lowering the corporate taxes and trying to, I guess as they call it, repatriate these funds that are held overseas by these U.S. corporations and have those dollars come back so that the government can tax them. Um, I wonder about that from an almost from an inflationary standpoint uh i don't know if it'd be significant enough that it would you know, cause much inflation but a lot of these things that he's talking about are uh, it's really difficult to predict how it might all play out should it come to pass and it, which i guess kind of gets back to what we talked about in the first question you know is is it really that predictable and straightforward as to as to how a trump administration is going to play out If we listen to what Mario Draghi, Christine Lagarde, and Fitch, just currently they said, oh, yeah, you know, Trump's economic policies, what they're forecasting is that the economy might, you know, suffer under this. And if the economy, not just here in the United States, but globally, starts to deteriorate, uh, it's because of Trump's policies. And Mario Draghi said this, Christine Lagarde said this, Fitch said this. And to me, it sounds like they're kind of setting him up to take the fall for the economy deteriorating as we move forward. Yeah, you know, and and on a, on that kind of similar note, Dave, you know, he's got Trump has as his chief trade advisor, I think is the guy's title, 
a gentleman by the name of Peter Navarro. Mm-hmm. And this guy set his sights on a, in a couple of places already. You know, that Trump has talked about Mexico and a border tax and tariffs and things like that. And and then Navarro himself was out talking about the ECB and the euro and and how the euro uh, is unbegun began uh, about a week or so ago. So we'll see. We'll see if it's as simple as everybody uh, leads you to believe. You know, all these rate hikes are getting priced in. We've been promised rate hikes since what 2009 yeah and so far we've gotten one each over the last two years I, you know i'm gonna have to see it to believe it um I, again i just i just don't know if 2017 will play out in the manner that you know everybody seems to expect it will now trump as he came into office actually when he was campaigning he was talking about get, you know bringing back jobs manufacturing other jobs keeping uh jobs from going overseas and he talked to Carrier, Ford, GM, and a lot of these companies, they're, they're still taking the jobs and moving them to Mexico. They haven't really changed anything. Now, as Trump is continually out there saying this, do you think with the current economy, do you think he can actually bring the jobs back to the U.S.? Will that even make a difference? Well, that's what you wonder about. You know, frankly, I have, uh, and this may sound like really way out there, whacked out, but I've always thought in a sense some of the job exporting was actually related in a way to the petrodollar scheme you know how um the the, the kissinger came up with that back in the early 70s you know if we always price energy in dollars there'll always be demand for dollars and those dollars that we print here will get incubated and recycled and all that kind of stuff and i think the tax structure of the u.s was also set up in a similar manner so that if we continue to offload manufacturing and, and get goods to be manufactured in other you know parts around the world and other places around the world where they can be manufactured uh, less expensively and then shipped here, that that is also um, a way to kind of incubate dollars, ship dollars overseas when we buy these other countries' goods uh, and again, get them all incubated. I, I you know, look, I'm I'm no tenured economist, so I haven't written paper undervalued versus a dollar, and that kind of rocked the currency markets one day a couple of weeks ago. Well, this cat Navarro, uh, besides being a, I guess he's a Harvard economist, he's an author, and two of his, I guess, more popular books, uh, one is called uh, The China Wars, and then the second one is called Death by China, and it's like, well, okay. <laughs> Uh, how long before this guy turns his sights on China? And, you know, the, one of the, if you want to call him the biggest currency manipulator, I don't, I would say the Japanese are probably the biggest currency manipulators, but with their, the way that PBOC pegs the yuan to the dollar, um, I think it's probably just a matter of time before that gets shoved to the forefront and Trump's trade policies vis-a-vis China and the tariffs and things like that that he discussed during the campaign. You just don't know how some of this stuff is going to play out, how it's going to be received, not only in the markets, but interpreted by the computers that run all the markets. Um, I, I, it would just have to wait and see. And I'll give you one more thing, too, Dave. You know, that there was one thing that really moved everything one day last week was when Trump mentioned something about, you know, his huge tax cuts that were coming and they were going to be spectacular and we'd have something in two or three weeks. And that sent the dollar, you know, screaming higher and that kind of thing. And um, that's like as if he's just going to wave a magic wand in two or three weeks and these things are going to happen and the effects on the economy are going to be instantaneous. You know, he might have a plan. He might have a couple of ideas he puts forth, but that stuff's got to go through Congress. And then it all has to then eventually take effect. And most of it wouldn't take effect immediately if it even did get passed. I mean, we talking late this year, next year. And then by the time any of that trickled down to the actual economy, it's another couple of quarters. But yet these markets these days, again, as they're all run by computers and all these computers scan the headlines, I guess I'll just draw back again to where we began. You know, I, I think we have to be kind of cautious with all of this stuff because we just don't know, one, what? Trump will suggest how and then how that will uh, affect all the different global markets. No, that's true. I I wanted to move on to gold right now. And last time you're on, we talked about Germany repatriating their gold. Uh, They wanted 300 tons. And it looks like that has been completed. It looks like they got all their gold back. But I don't know if you saw this, but something was very interesting about the gold bars they received. 
they had different labels on the bars than yeah. what they had before. And that is kind of strange. Does that tell you something? Does that mean that maybe the Fed really didn't have the gold? Right. What does that say to you? Well, that was kind of the thought at the time. Um, yeah, it, that's always been part of it. And then, if I recall right, the in the first six or seven metric tons that they that they pulled out in 2013, they they immediately had them recast. And that how that initially worked. I mean, they shipped them some to some refinery in Germany or Switzerland and had them recast and all that. And people thought, you know, was the U.S. just kind of fending off some of their old coin melt bars from the 1930s, you know, that were 90 percent purity? Uh, it, it, there were I just have always been all these questions surrounding that German repatriation schedule. And, you know, as you talk about um, Europe and Germany, I that's certainly an interesting item. I But, you know, as we look forward into this year, I think perhaps even more compelling will be the demand for physical from just everyday Europeans, because one of the things that hasn't changed is obviously Brexit is moving forward now. We're going to have a vote. Well, we had the vote of the House of Commons was last week, and now the House of Lords will be back. I think it's a week from Friday, and they'll begin whatever they do to eventually give Prime Minister May the approval to go ahead with Article 50 and Brexit. And then we've got now we've got everything that's going on in Greece.